In FDR's 1933 inaugural speech, he said, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. There are many different fears and phobias, aren't there? Agrophobia is the fear of heights. Aerophobia is the fear of flying. Agoraphobia is the fear of open spaces. I hope none of you suffer from anthropophobia, which is the fear of people. Then there is aquaphobia, which is the fear of water. Fairly common is arachnophobia, which is the fear of spiders. Some of you know that. Claustrophobia is one of the better well-knowns, the fear of closed spaces. Any children here who fear the darkness, afraid of the dark? That's nyctophobia. And then, of course, there is ophidiophobia, which is the fear of snakes. I'm told that the most common fears are the fear of spiders, not quite sure why, but spiders, snakes, and heights. So if you're on the top of a ladder and are confronted with a snake with a spider on top of it, many of you are really going to fear. If we don't suffer from these fears, we may think those who have such fears uh, are rather silly, but the reality is all of us have fears. Some of you this morning are afraid afraid of the future, afraid that your husband or wife will leave you, afraid of never getting married, afraid of not making the team, afraid of an abusive husband, an abusive father, afraid of getting fired at work, afraid that you'll not have enough money to live on as you get older, afraid of having a terminal illness, afraid of dying, afraid of failure, afraid of not meeting the expectations you have for yourself or that others have for you, afraid of failing the exam, of flunking out of college, afraid that some dark secret in your past one day will be revealed, afraid of having no friends, of being alone, afraid of your children leaving home, and perhaps the real fear of your children not leaving home. <laughs> yes, fear is one of the most common of all human emotions. The bravest of warriors know fear. The toughest of athletes experience fear. The richest of people experience fear. The most intellectually bright of people experience fear. And uh, with that being the case, and I'm sure none of us would argue with that, it's not surprising that one of the most common commands in the Bible is, fear not, fear not. These words come from the living God. And so on the authority of the Word of God, I say it afresh to you. I want you to understand this. I want this truth to grip your very soul this morning. Will you listen to God? He's talking to you, whoever you are. And the word is this morning, fear not. How wonderful. In the grace of God and with the strength of God, you may not only face your fears, but soar high with wings of eagles above them. Fear not. Let's think, first of all, perhaps rather strangely, but accurately, that this is a command. Let's look at the command. Open your Bibles to Isaiah, somewhere in the middle of your Bibles in this series with Wings Like Eagles. We've turned over and over again uh, to Isaiah, and we do this this morning, this wonderful Old Testament prophet. And uh, we're looking, first of all, at Isaiah 41. I encourage you to come with your Bibles if you don't have one. Uh, there's one in the pew in front of you. Take that. We're going to be looking at a lot of uh, verses. And if you believe in underlining uh, your Bible from time to time, as I sometimes do, not too often, otherwise you'd end up underlining everything. It's all the Word of God. Uh, but these words we're going to read to today are some of the most beautiful, comforting words ever written. First of all, the command, Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Here it is. Are you listening? Fear not. That's a command. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Verse 13. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. 
It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Here's the point. It is God who's saying to you, fear not. Chapter 43, Isaiah 43, verse 1. For now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by my name, your mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, people in exchange for your life. Fear not, verse 5, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Brilliant verses, aren't they? Chapter 44, Isaiah 44, verse 1. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb and will help you. Fear not. Verse 8, Isaiah 44, verse 8, fear not. You getting the point? What am I saying to you over and over and over again? Fear not. Here it is. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I told you from of old and declared it, and you are my witnesses? Is there a God beside me? There is no rock. I know not any. The command is, fear not. But someone says, well, these Scriptures are wonderful, but what's the context? What are the circumstances? Who is God speaking to? Well, the context of these commands is the magnificent last section of the prophecy of Isaiah here in chapters 40 through 66, which if you haven't read for some time, I do commend to you. Isaiah the prophet is writing around 700 B.C., and he's making a prophecy. He's anticipating the events when Israel will be in captivity in Babylon, and his prophecy comes true. The Babylonians conquer Israel around 605 B.C., led by their famous king, Nebuchadnezzar, they ransack Jerusalem, they burn the temple, and they take many Israelites back into captivity in Babylon, such people as Daniel and Ezekiel. Why had God allowed His people to be taken into captivity? Well, instead of worshiping the true and living God, the Israelites had turned from the Word of God. They had worshiped false idols, and they had followed their own sinful desires. But now, in chapters 40 through 66, Isaiah is demonstrating great hope and a magnificent future of a restoration of Israel to the Promised Land. Israel had turned from God, that's true, but God never forsakes His people. And the prophet Isaiah, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, foresees the time when the Babylonian captivity will come to an end and the people of Israel will return to their land. So these chapters are focusing on God's deliverance, on God's salvation of His people. The message is God saves. When your trust is in Him, you have a magnificent future. You are people of hope. Haven't we all turned from God? Hasn't each person here fallen into the captivity of sin? Haven't you chosen your sinful desires rather than God? Isn't it the case that rather than obeying the first commandment that you will have no other gods beside me, that 
things and people and situations and your ambition and your career and your pleasures and your money and your family and your sport and yourself have in practice been first in your life, that in a sense, in a very real sense, you've become an idolater. And to such people who should have known better than to forsake God, Isaiah brings to, the, to these people, but brings yes to you and to me, these words of comfort, these words of hope, these words of a future, and they come to us with fresh power this morning because they're coming from the living God. Here is the command to you today. Will you take it personally? Here is God's voice to you in all of your circumstances. Yes, the vast majority of here would, if we were honest, say, yes, we have fears about some things. Here is the Word of God to you. Yes, to you. Fear not. That's the command. And it is to such people that they much loved and quoted, sometimes out of context, the words of Jeremiah 29 come in the same circumstance. Jeremiah is saying much the same thing when he writes in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. What's the context of Jeremiah 29? The people are in captivity. The people have sinned. But listen to what the word is. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all of the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Wonderful words of comfort, of hope, and of future, but remember the context. They are written to a people in captivity who have sinned, but here is the promise, if you repent, if you return to the Lord your God, if you turn from your evil ways, not just in your lips, but in your actions, God has a glorious future for you. No need to fear, no need to worry, no need to be anxious, fear not. That's the command. Now, what are the reasons why we should not fear? You say, well, that's very easy, John, to say, fear not, but why not? I'm, a, I'm an anxious person, I'm a fearful person. Well, the basic message that Isaiah is saying, and we've seen this over and over again, and we sing about it, and we talk about it, and we read about it, and we're going to read it about it again this morning, is this, because of who the Lord is. Over and over again, Isaiah asks the rhetorical question, do you know anyone other than this God? Is there anyone greater than the Lord? No, fear not because of who the Lord is. I want to give you four descriptions that Isaiah gives us of the Lord. There are many. First of all, the Lord is your Creator. Your Creator, the one who made you, is the one who's saying to you, fear not. Our children sang about it. Let's read it, Isaiah 40, verse 28. Keep your Bible open. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Who is this one who is saying, fear not? He's the Lord. He's God. He's the Creator. Isaiah 40, 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the Creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He is the Creator. Chapter 43. We already read it. Look at it again. Verse 1, Isaiah 43, verse 1. For thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not. Verse 7, Everyone who is called by My name, whom I created for My glory, 
whom I formed and made. Chapter 44, verse 2, thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb and will help you fear no. Isn't that great to know? God made me, fearfully and wonderfully made, not just a chance, not just a product of evolution, but a direct creation by God, that God made you. He knows your name. He formed you from your mother's womb. He knows who you are, and it is this God who is your creator who today is saying to you, I created you for my glory. I've got plans for you, therefore fear not. Not only God is our creator, as I remem- reminds us, He is our redeemer. Again, Isaiah 43, verse 1. The Lord not only is your creator, He is your redeemer. But now, says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. Don't you love that? Chapter 44, verse 21. Chapter 44, 21, remember these things, O Jacob, O Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you. There we have it. God's our creator. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. Do you sometimes forget your friends? Yes. Do you forget someone who's helped you in the past? Yes. God never, ever forgets. Verse 22, this is written to those who have been redeemed, to believers. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forests, and every tree in it. Why? For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. We're thinking this evening, as we think of the life of Moses, about the redemption uh, from Egyptian captivity. The children of Israel under the leadership of Moses are delivered from slavery in Egypt. He leads them through the Red Sea, and Joshua is going to lead them into the Promised Land. The people of Israel have been redeemed. They've been freed from their captivity. That's the point. This is a God who has redeemed us, who has delivered us. We belong to God. And as we come to the New Testament, we realize that our Lord Jesus Christ frees us not from Egyptian bondage, but a far greater bondage, the bondage of sin, the bondage of the fear of death. Listen to Hebrews 2, verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, He Himself, our Lord, likewise partook of the same things, that through death He might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. The fear of death? That's a great fear, isn't it? Who could deliver us from that fear? Who can deliver us from the bondage of our sin? Uh, Who can liberate us from these sinful desires and this strong force in our life that pulls us down? Is there a deliverer? Is there a redeemer? Of course there is. There is our Lord Jesus Christ who comes into the world to deliver us. And He does that, as the writer of Hebrews is saying, He does that by dying for our sins, by being buried, and rising from the dead, conquering Satan, conquering the one who holds us in his grip, conquering us from this fear of death, this fear of death which is the king of terrors and the terror of kings. And so now we have been redeemed. We began our service this morning by the orchestra and the prelude reminding us that we have been redeemed. We love to proclaim it. 
redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, that Peter says, no, you weren't redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, the blood of the Lamb, who is spotless, that we as the people of God have been delivered, and I now belong to my Lord Jesus Christ. He has purchased me. I am bought with my, a price. If, you're a, if you have been redeemed, you belong to Jesus Christ. You're part of His family. So why are you fearful is the point. He has redeemed you. He's done the most difficult thing by delivering you from sin. So why would these problems in life distract you and would uh, allow you to be so captive? He's your Creator. He is your Redeemer. He's the resurrection and the life. Therefore, fear not. The Lord is your Creator, number one. Secondly, the Lord is your Redeemer. Third, the Lord is your Savior, closely linked, of course, with the concept of redemption, but that's Isaiah's theme, that the Lord saves. Look back to chapter 43. Isaiah 43, verse 3. He told us in verse 1, fear not. Why? For I am the Lord your God, Isaiah 43, verse 3, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Yes, he's, he's redeemed us. He has saved us. Chapter 43, verse 11. I, I am the Lord. We thought of that several weeks ago. The Lord, Yahweh, the self-existent one, the great I am, the eternal one. I, I'm the Lord. And besides me, there is no Savior. Is there anyone else who can save you? Is there anyone else who can forgive your sins? Is there anyone else who can take you from darkness into His marvelous light? Is there anyone who can deliver you through death and take you into God's eternal presence? Do you know of anyone? And Isaiah is saying over and over again, no, there is only one Savior. Peter the Apostle puts it this way, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Himself is going to say, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father apart from Me. No, there is only one Savior. Chapter 45, verse 22. Here's the command. Turn to me. The old King James says, look to me and be saved. Oh, why? Oh, why look to the Lord? He's the only Savior. Turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth. This is a message not just to Israel, not just to Americans, but to all people. Why? For I am God and there is no other, no other salvation. We're told today there are many ways to God, there's many ways to salvation, and Isaiah would say, and all of Scripture would say, absolutely not. The Lord God is unique. There is none like Him, that there is none like our Lord Jesus Christ. There never was and there never will be anyone like Him. He is the unique God, and He is the only Savior. 45 verse 22 was the verse that Spurgeon, that was used in the providence of God to bring Charles Spurgeon as a teenager to saving faith in Christ, and he was going to become one of the greatest preachers ever. He tells a story uh, that one Sunday it's snowing in, in, in London, and uh, he's looking for a place to worship, and he, he says he finds himself in this small church uh, in the primitive Methodists. And uh, the preacher hadn't turned up, snowed up, Spurgeon says, and, and he said, this, this man went up to preach. He said, he wasn't much of a preacher. He said, uh, he's a shoemaker or something like that. And uh, he, Spurgeon says, he was a very poor preacher, but he had a very good verse. That's the secret of preaching, <laughs> get a good verse, right? And Spurgeon said, 
he didn't really say much other than saying the most important thing of quoting Isaiah 45, 22 over and over again, look unto me and be ye saved, for I am God and there is none else. Then lifting up his hands, I quote from Spurgeon, he shouted as only a primitive Methodist could do, with apologies to any primitive Methodist here. <laughs> Young man, look to Jesus Christ. Look, look, look. You have nothing to do but look and live. Spurgeon says, you listening? I saw it once the way of salvation. I know not what else he said. I didn't take much notice of it. I was so possessed with that one thought. I've been waiting to do 50 things. But when I heard that word, look, what a charming word it seemed to me. Oh, I looked until I could almost have looked my eyes away. There and then the cloud was gone. The darkness had rolled away. And that moment I saw the sun. And I could have risen that instant and sung with the most enthusiastic of them of the precious blood of Christ and the simple faith which looks alone to Him. That's it. Oh, that someone had told me this before. Trust Christ and you'll be saved. Do you get that? No need to fear your death. No need to fear eternal damnation. Look to Christ. Turn to Him and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I'm God and there is no other. He's our Creator. He's our Redeemer. He's our Savior. Fourth, the Lord is your helper. Isn't it good to know? We all like people in life who can help us. Imagine having the Lord as your helper. That's what we have. Isaiah 41, verse 10. We read it. Let me read it again. Fear not, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed. Some of you are dismayed today. You're discouraged. You're down. You're perhaps a little bitter about something. Don't be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Verse 13, I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Imagine having the Lord on your side. Imagine always having the Lord with you. What are you afraid of is the point. He is there to help her, and He's with us, with us in the most difficult and excruciating situations of life, situations which would produce fear and confusion and uncertainty. He's told us this, in chapter 43 that I read, when you pass through the waters, I'm with you. Through the rivers, they won't overwhelm you. Through, when you walk through the fire, you won't be burned. What's, what's Isaiah doing? He, he's saying, uh, picture a, a flood that's going to sweep you away. Uh, picture a terrible fire. We've been thinking of these awful fires in California. Think of, think of that. That will make you afraid, won't it? No, says Isaiah. Remember this that God is with you. Afraid when you're, you're scattered in captivity? Chapter 43, verse 5, no, God's going to bring you back. God is going to restore you. Some of you have wandered away from the Lord. Your, your heart is hardened. You've fallen into to sin, and, and you think, God won't take me back. I've, I've messed up. Fear not. The Lord is your helper. We read in chapter 43, verse 4, these precious words, you are precious in my eyes. I love you. Here is a God who not only is great, who can create everything, is a God of love, a, a, a God of great compassion, a God who is with me. Psalm 121, this, this Lord is the keeper. Uh, he neither slumbers nor sleeps. Isaiah, um, Psalm 121. He never goes on vacation. He's watching over you. He watches your, your going in and your coming out. He's your, he's your keeper. He's your helper. An old woman in the village was asked why she was not afraid during an earthquake. How are you not afraid? She says, I rejoice 
but I know the God who shakes the world. Shaken, battered, bruised, life unfair, tragedy come, injustice, yes. But do you know God, the Creator, the Redeemer, the Savior, the Helper? And this God can be trusted. In a changing world of fears and anxieties, God is our unchanging and unchangeable rock. We've seen that over and over again from Isaiah 44, verse 8. He is this everlasting rock, unchanging and unchangeable. God is always 100% reliable. Friends can let you down. Family can let you down. Counselors can let you down. The best of people can let you down. But God never, ever, ever fails. He is 100% faithful. And God never gets tired of us. You ever gone to someone for help and you realize you're kind of irritating them? <laughs> right? Someone come, or someone comes to you and you think, oh, not again. I guess I've got to be nice to this person. Uh, try and help them a little bit. And you're grudging. God's never like that, is He? Faithful, compassionate. His character is constant. He's a faithful God. Whatever your fears, the Lord is with you, Creator, Redeemer, Savior, and Helper. Will you stand and read this verse? I want to wake some of you up. <laughs> You're getting too comfortable there. Hebrews 13, verse 6, a short verse. Let's read it thoughtfully. Beautiful verse. And as you read it, say, is this true? Ask God to help this to be a reality in your life. Read it with me. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Let's read it again. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Amen. Please be seated. What are we to do? We are to replace fear with faith, our trouble with trust. Obey the command. Don't focus on the tough circumstances. They will produce fear. Stand on the promises of God. We live in a world when it's difficult to know who to believe and what to believe. Think of the, the spin of the politician, the hyperbole of the salesman, the, the hype of the advertiser. But God's Word is absolute truth. This book is absolute truth. God cannot lie, and He's spoken in His Word. We believe in the inspiration of Holy Scripture that when God speaks in His Word, or when the Bible speaks, it is God speaking. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. Our culture says there's no absolute truth. It's all a matter of opinion, personal preferences, your truth. Postmodernism is built on the absurd foundation that it is a fact that there are no facts. <laughs> Just your personal viewpoint. It's all your opinion. That's what you think. That's cool, man. You're okay. I'm okay. Isaiah has reminded us, hasn't he, in chapter 40, verse 8, that the grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. The opinions of men and women come and go. They have their ideas. They have their viewpoints. They have their opinions. But they're all, in a sense, swept away. And in the difficult times of life, many of us have experienced, I know here, that we stand on the Word of God. It is God's absolute truth. It is, as the psalmist says, forever settled in the heavens. It is God's eternal Word. So, think of what we've read today. When God tells you not to fear because He's with you, trust Him. When God tells you not to fear because He will strengthen you, trust Him. When God tells you not to fear because He has redeemed you, you belong to Him, and He's going to help you, trust Him. Don't you believe God? Are you really questioning God? The answer to your fear is faith. Faith not in yourself, 
Not in a physician, not in an employer, not in your resources, not in your family and friends, but trust in God, the Word of God, the rock of ages. His promises are unfailing. His promises are unassailable. His faithful promises flow from His immutable, His un changing faithfulness. Isaiah is saying this. There's only one God. There's only one rock. There's only one Redeemer, one Savior, one Helper. Therefore, trust Him. This is what it means to live the Christian life, isn't it? Living by faith, different from the world, isn't it? Standing on the faithful, unchanging promises of God. I'm not minimizing your difficult circumstances. I know some of them excruciatingly difficult. I understand you've been shaken. I understand you're fearful, but listen to the Word of God. Fear not. No situation is too difficult for him. No situation is too insignificant for him. He'll never leave you, says the psalmist, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That'll scare you, won't you? walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I spoke to a couple who are this week who are literally there, walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Why? For you're with me, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That God watches over us with the gentleness of a shepherd and with the vigilant protection of a mighty warrior. Therefore, don't be afraid. Fear not. When Alexander the Great was asked how he could sleep soundly when surrounded by so much personal danger with his enemies around him, he replied that Parmenio, his faithful general, was watching. Alexander the Great could sleep soundly because he knew that his mighty warrior was protecting him. We have a more powerful watcher than Parmenio, don't we? The psalmist says, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds His people from this time forth and forevermore. The Lord is watching you, sister. The Lord cares for you. He's protecting you. He's keeping with you. He won't desert you. He will give you all the grace and all of the strength you need. Therefore, fear not. You're about to have surgery. Fear not. You're beginning a new career fear not. You're alone, a spouse, close friend has died, fear not. You've been abandoned or betrayed by a husband, by a wife, by a family member, a friend, a parent, fear not. You're starting a new school, a new job, a new situation, fear not. You're beginning a new ministry here at Calvary. You, you, you signed up to help over the Christmas ministries, and you're, you're anxious about it. You're a bit afraid, fear not. You have a serious illness? fear not. You think you're about to lose your job? Fear not. You're getting old? Fear not. You feel very young and vulnerable, anxious? Fear not. Yes, with God's help and in His grace, not only can you face that fear, you can soar high with wings of eagles above them. Are you still fearful? Fear not. Have you not known have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God, the Creator of the ends of the earth? He doesn't faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What's God saying to you today? Two words, fear not. We're going to sing a hymn which I trust will deepen our faith in God, that God is our shield and our defender. Will you pray with me, and will you take these fears, and remember that God is your Creator, that God is your Redeemer, that God is your Savior and 
your helper. Father, we thank you for your gracious word. It comes to us how we need it. We're people of fears and anxieties, and so we thank you for these magnificent words written thousands of years ago, but they have come to us today with power, with conviction, with comfort. May our faith be strengthened, and may those who don't know Christ look to Him today and be saved. And may we who know the Savior fear not. May we mount up with wings like eagles. May, may we run and not be weary. May we walk and not faint. And we ask it in Christ's wonderful name, our Savior and our Redeemer and our Helper. Amen.